Galaxy S4 here, according to Samsung, and I quote from its own promo material, is like nothing you've ever seen before. Yes, uh, completely different. Revolutionary, in fact. Oh, come on. Who are Samsung kidding? The S4 is an evolutionary upgrade from the existing S3. Evolutionary. Happily, evolution is mainly good, whether in nature or indeed technology, meaning that things are getting better and more refined, more fit for purpose. In the S4's case, it meant taking the S3, which had already sold over 50 million units worldwide, making the screen larger, five inches rather than 4.8, higher resolution, 1080p rather than 720p. Though I did note rather disappointingly that outdoor visibility was a bit worse on the S4, so it's not all positive here. Making the camera better, 13 megapixels, and yes, Samsung are world experts in smartphone image processing, getting the absolute most from a tiny sensor. You actually get benefit from the extra resolution in most decent light conditions. Uh, here are some samples, most of which I was very impressed by. See all about Symbian for my S4 head-to-head -head with the phone world's camera champion, the Nokia 808 filming the show. And here's some sample 1080p video footage shot in reasonable light. Predictably, it doesn't fare quite so well indoors or at night. Test of video footage on the Samsung Galaxy S4. Pretty impressive at 1080p here in weak spring sunshine in the UK. Making the processor faster, a Snapdragon 600 or Exynos octa-core, according to market, giving it more RAM, two gigabytes rather than one. So loading up the most demanding games and web pages means never having to see lag while stuff gets shuffled in and out of memory. Making the speaker louder, this is a personal bugbear of mine for listening to podcasts mainly. The S4's rear-mounted mono loudspeaker is demonstrably louder, here we go, and of higher quality than the S3. Yeah, 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 very uh, action-tastic. Not quite up to HTC One levels, maybe half of that volume and quality, but certainly up with the iPhone 5 and Nokia 808 and so forth. Uh, making the battery larger, the back just peels off here, 2,600 milliamp hours rather than 2,100. In practice, you're still only lucky to get a full day out of it, but mainly because you won't be able to put this thing down. And obviously and flexibly, it's still fully user replaceable, paving the way for extended batteries and replacement backs, or just buying a new cell a year down the line because yours now only charges to 60% capacity. Sticking in the other usual top end specs, including NFC and LTE, adding in more software, more, oh, that's cool gimmicks, more Samsung UI innovations, uh, that all adds up, as I say, to an evolution of the S3. The S4 really is the uh, S3, but better. Hang on, you'll say. In your recent top five, Steve, you put the S3 in instead of the S4. How can the S4 be better? Ah, oh, yes, but that was taking into account a few of the downsides, and that was most definitely taking into account the price of this, the Galaxy S4. Never mind all the plastic, five inch Super AMOLED screens here at 1080p do not come cheap. This display is well over 200 pounds sterling to replace if you break it. And I bet that's over 100 pounds each, even at Samsung's end in the factory. Octa-core or Snapdragon 600 processors also, they're not dime a dozen and so on. Which is why the S4 is currently over 570 pounds on the UK high street which is outrageous by anyone's standards for a sliver of plastic and glass. Of course, most people, and I've talked to numerous real world S4 owners, will choose the S4 from a network as part of their next, quote, free upgrade on their usual £40 a month contract. USA style, price is absolutely not an issue for them. Tough to go down my usual recommended SIM free route here. The other reason I was hesitating to stick the S4 in my top five is that not all the evolution is good after all. There's the internal storage issue, now famously even mentioned on TV and Watchdog, so it's gone mainstream. By my calculations, there are two gigabytes less to play with here on the internal 16 gigabyte system disk than on the S3. By the time you've installed just your essential apps, i.e. no games, no media, you'll be below eight gigabytes free, <laughs> half the quoted amount. And that's on day one, hour one. Stick on a few games and shoot some test videos and you'll be edging towards five gigabytes free by the end of day one. Micro SD support here is Samsung's uh, way out of this limitation, though Samsung don't, repeat, don't 
ship a memory card with the Galaxy S4. I had to add this. <laughs> You'd have thought that an eight gigabyte card or so, five, six dollars worth, would have been trivial to include, if only as a sorry for the system disk bloat. These days, Android OS revolves around all applications and importantly games living in the internal system disk. Now, luckily, the biggest and most professional games are set to auto download their large resource files to micro SD, which helps. Plus, TouchWiz here also offers to switch the default camera file saving to be on the card immediately after you insert it. So in practice, the lower free system disk space shouldn't be a showstopper, but it's still galling. And yes, it will continue to get press attention. So internal storage aside, we've established that the Galaxy S4 is an overall improvement over the already rather splendid Galaxy S3. Yes, it's still plastic, though uh, there's a heck of a lot of good electronics packed inside. Now, what about those uh, gimmicks mentioned earlier, the ones mentioned in the bullet points in Samsung's promo videos? Some are fluff, some are erratic in effectiveness, but I was actually quite impressed that Samsung have intelligently configured the aids. Not everything's turned on out of the box and the help screens do introduce each aid quite well. Like the HTC One, 2013's craze is to have an infrared blaster built into the top of the phone. And Samsung's watch on here includes licensed software from infrared specialists Peel. And like on the one, it failed to work properly. With my only five-year-old Toshiba DVR meekly offering me the chance to send a bug report to the developers. Gah! <laughs> There's the usual TouchWiz home key S voice travesty. Surely every single user eventually disables this to make the home button work immediately and not half a second later. Not to mention that S voice isn't as good as Google now, which is also here and more traditionally accessed. But my biggest beef was with the eye tracking, which is ridiculously hit and miss. It hardly works at all with glasses, so I tried without these and in good light. The main Samsung content apps, including here the stock browser, though interestingly, not Chrome, then respond to the eye tracking and quote smart scroll. Let's give it a go. OK, well, I'm reading and I'm looking at the bottom of the page and wait for it. Wait for it. It's scrolling and stop. No, that's too far. I haven't read that bit yet. No, 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 no. Back up, back up, back up, back up. No, 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 that's too far. I've read that bit. It's an exercise in frustration and eye muscle strain. And you as you strive to bend the tech to your will, when there's a perfectly good touchscreen right in front of you. Gah! And of course, the tech doesn't work at all with glasses or in indifferent light. <laughs> the Myriad Air functions here, they work quite well, but they're not exactly essential and they're frustratingly inconsistent. For example, you can air glance at your S4 even when the screen's off by just passing your hand over the sensor. A nice time and status summary, but you can't unlock from this screen. You've still got to press a button first. And the AirView previews only work with specific Samsung specified applications. So there's no email preview in the Gmail app, for example. Then there are the camera modes for clairvoyance. At least they can see into the future and they know that the photo they're about to take would turn out to be a great candidate for a razor or drama shot burst modes. The rest of us would uh, just take the shot and think, oh, darn, if only I. <laughs> in truth, there's far more here that I could try and then dismiss this gimmicky, but that will be unfair to Samsung. Everything's dead simple to turn off if you don't need it, and I'm sure you get a big bit of a battery boost from doing so, while a feature that's annoying to me might actually be a killer feature to some other user. TouchWiz is what it is. Yes, it's a little cartoonish in places. Yes, you can't really tell that it's the very latest Android 4.2.2 underneath, and yes, I'm still irritated by the amount of extra Samsung stuff which just isn't needed. Chat on, S Translate, uh, even the whole Samsung hub stuff. But there are also lots of tweaks to Android which are actually genuinely useful. Being able to custom order apps in the main app launcher or even hide them all together. Being able to add or remove home screens here and cycling around home screens in it like an infinite carousel. Not to mention the discreet menu key here down the bottom left and the continuing usefulness of a physical home button which can wake the device without any finger contortions. What about general annoyances? I also noticed that the camera has a noticeable shutter lag. So let's try it. Take a photo now and half a second later, off it goes. We've got so used to smartphone cameras with zero shutter lag that the Galaxy S4's application here stands out as slow. The app is lifted from the standalone Galaxy camera and I'm sure 
I'm positive there's optimization to come. And Samsung do have a good history of providing updates to their flagships. The Galaxy S2 from two years ago has still been getting OS updates, I noted recently. Early days then of the Galaxy S4. If you own an S3, and given the huge price difference, there's not really enough here to warrant get selling it to get the GS4, if I'm honest. By all means, wait six months for the early software nickels to be overcome and then pick it up for a much reduced price. If you're on contract and offered an S4, grab it with both hands. It really is just about the biggest, baddest, most flexible smartphone in existence and will only get better as Samsung fiddles with the firmware. However, either way, you'll still need a case of some sort to protect the super expensive screen against drops and to help avoid touching the clammy fingerprint magnet that is the plastic back. This is the premium smartphone that feels not quite so premium. And yet, as they say on the street, still kicks ass in almost every department. This is the Samsung Galaxy S4. Congratulations on 200 shows, Steve. My name's Jamie Holland. My current phone is the Razer Eye. I love the rock solid build, the big screen with a tiny bezel, a phone sized phone for one handed users and the amazing battery life without having to turn loads of services off. Google Now works really well with the Jelly Bean upgrade, uh, but there's a bit of lag in the system, particularly in Chrome and the Play Store. My own setup consists of a single home screen with a couple of widgets and a pan full of apps at the bottom. It's easily rooted and there's loads of custom ROMs for tinkerers. There isn't much to dislike about the Razer Eye, unless you lust over leading edge specs for the sake of it. Hi, I'm Luke Vernade and my phone is the Nokia 808. I like it not only for the camera, but the other really good features like the screen, speaker and Symbian. I would hold it up to show it, but I'm using it to record this, so I can't. Oh, and happy 200th episode. Hmm, solidarity or bemused laughter? My last five devices have lived in a leather case on my belt, and the tradition's continued by my biggest beautiful Galaxy Note 1 running Jellybean 4.1.2. Steve, I can get my hand all the way around it very comfortably. Ted, I can operate it one-handed very comfortably. I tend to keep it in landscape mode. In fact, I switched off portrait. I prefer to work in landscape at all times. Uh, I don't mind that it's what some people call a brick. I like doing arm wrestling training when I'm on the phone. I love that it's two centimeters thick. That gives it the feel of something substantial in the hand. Moreover, those two centimeters contain a 5,400 milliamp extended battery, which gives me three days use and a kickstand. Steve, 30 seconds, big is best. Hey Mr Litchfield, huge congratulations on making it to episode 200 of The Phone Show. My name's Christopher Wright and I'm currently using the Nokia Lumia 920, which I think is the best phone out there. Uh, I first started with this fella, the 5800, and went on to the Nokia N8, which is recording this. I then had a Lumia 800, a Lumia 710, a Lumia 900. Um, what do all those phones have in common? Well, yeah, they're all Nokias, but also I watched your reviews before buying any of them. I look forward to the next 200 episodes, Steve. Take care. Hi, my review is on the Nokia N9 smartphone, which is running Mego Harmatin. The N9 was released late 2011, and it's now May 2013, but this is still my number one phone of choice. And that's mainly because the Mego Harmatin UI is just so fluid and easy to use. Um, the biggest selling point for me with this phone, which is why I love it so much, it's so easy, is that you can be in apps and then simply swipe and go back to that app that you needed to get back into. So for instance, you could be in Tweetion, sending your tweets and go straight back into the calculator, work out the tip for your meal, go straight into the calls that you've made, go straight into something else, and everything just works really fluidly and nicely. And that's why I really love the N9. Even though it's not the newest of smartphones, it's running quite old hardware now by comparison, this is my uh, most favorite smartphone of all time. Hello, Steve. Neil from Edinburgh here. Just wanted to say congratulations on the 200th show and also share my current device setup. I have here an HTC One X, not the latest handset, but still a gorgeous device nonetheless. I'm running CyanogenMod 10.1, which is basically Android 4.2.2 with a few extra bells and whistles. So, for example, you can unlock with the volume rocker on the side now. No more stretching for the hard to reach unlock button at the top of the phone. And you can also lock and unlock by swiping the capacitive 
buttons at the bottom of the handset which is just really elegant. You also get a nice pulsing effect on the capacitive buttons when you receive a notification. Running at Nova Launcher Prime, again more customizable compared to the stock launcher um, and that's my setup. Once again congratulations on the 200th show, many thanks. Hi Steve, Julie Alderson here. Congratulations on your 200th edition of The Phone Show and here's to 200 more. I run this, Lumia 800, absolutely love it, suits all my needs. I like the photos on the lock screen. The most recent update enabled me to have smaller tiles so all my apps fit on one screen. Knew you'd like that. Now, the second part is the phone I missed out on. This. I love the E71. I've just kidnapped this off my husband. He doesn't know I've got it, so I've got to put it back quick. So I'll say bye. Bye, Steve. Hello, Steve. Um, well done on going to 200 shows. Um, this is my Lumia 720, which I think is wonderful. It's very pretty, and it does just about everything. I'm filming this on my Samsung Galaxy S3 Mini, which I hate because it's really ugly, both the software and the hardware. But they both do everything, actually, and are perfectly operable phones. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.